Today we're going to talk about uh, about value, and one of the great things about today's discussion, um, as has been mentioned, we um, have this new book now that I recently published, uh, Pursuing Enterprise Outcomes. We'll touch on some of the chapters today. We'll talk about value, we'll talk about um, outcomes, and we'll try to ground ourselves in a better understanding of contextual value in your particular environment. Almost every enterprise needs to understand what to build and what to focus their attention on and what actually can be delayed or delivered later or not delivered at all necessarily. So really crucial notions. And it's important not only to high profile stakeholders, but also to those team members and practitioners that are directly involved in uh, creating value. So we'll talk about that today, but we'll start with a slightly different story that will reveal to us the intricacies of human systems and how value is created in such systems. So let's begin. We have two people, Brenda and Jaden, connected in some way, right? These might be two marketing professionals that are working on the same marketing campaign, or maybe they are just two software developers that are working on the shared feature. And they're progressing quite well. They can uh, collaborate with one another. They, they, they maybe are co-located in, in, at least in the same time zone and they can share a screen to, to, to one another every once in a while. They can debug their code together. They can do a lot of things that help them overlap. And bit by bit, they're progressing towards the goal. Now, let's start altering the parameters of this collaboration and see what happens. So our first thing here will be, let's assume that they are now separated in terms of time zones. Also, they're separated maybe in a very inconvenient way so that when Brenda comes to work, she can't interact with Jaden because he has already uh, finished his, his uh, day and probably left uh, a few emails or something like that, or maybe some notes. And same happens the other way, right? What they've noticed after a while of, of collaborating this way that some inconsistencies in their code had started to accumulate. And over time, they noticed that they are spending more and more time resolving those inconsistencies as opposed to just progressing with the feature. The impact of this disconnect that they currently have, and the disconnect is not necessarily because of the different time zones, but because they didn't care enough or couldn't establish a better collaboration pattern given the time zone difference. The result of this is that the capacity is no longer fully uh, dedicated to creating value. Now there's a certain chunk of that capacity that is basically uh, wasted to resolving inconsistencies that otherwise wouldn't have existed. Uh, let's keep changing the parameters, though, and let's assume that besides the time zone issue, they also developed a personal conflict. Maybe Jaden said some nasty things about Brenda's approach to uh, programming uh, non-serializable objects in the past, and now it's on. Now they are not communicating even via the email when they could, but they don't want to, unless highly necessary. So now there's even more inconsistencies because there's even less interaction that would be productive interaction. So our picture changes even further. Now even more capacity is wasted to resolving the disconnect and so on. Maybe they also have a tremendous gap in, uh, in the skill sets, in the expertise, and that only adds to uh, the problem with capacity because very simply, they may be speaking different languages from the technology standpoint, from their awareness of the business and so on. So see, we often assume that if we have a team or a bunch of people collaborating, we're forgetting that it's a complex system. And as every complex system, the most important thing is the connections, the crucial connections that make the system work and make it productive. And those disconnects that may emerge 
may completely determine the productivity of that group. But Brenda and Jaden are not alone in, in their ecosystem. There's more, there, there, there are other teams, there are other stakeholders, and maybe the ones that are the closest to them are the customer. The customer is not necessarily a simple uh, thing. It's, it's, it's a group of people as well. So we're getting another picture where there's a customer domain this time, but the customer has the customer representative and the user, the end consumer of what they are creating. And what is really interesting is that uh, they are disconnected in this case. And this is often happening too, uh, where the end user, they just have a day job, right? And they don't necessarily uh, look to see what is that that the IT guys have to, to deliver to them. They have things they have to accomplish on a daily basis. And the customer representative may be overconfident in her own ability to de define uh, requirements for the development team and doesn't think that they need the end user to be involved. And here we go, the disconnect. And this disconnect in here, well, maybe this is the product owner who um, doesn't necessarily add much to bridging the gap, but rather acts as a translator between the two groups only adding, in this case, adding more um, uh, ambiguity. So here's what's interesting. As soon as we get more than one disconnect in the system, these disconnects may start uh, reinforcing one another. And this is how it may happen in this example. So imagine that the customer representative um, produces some requirements in whatever the manner, right? Either in traditional way or in more of a lean and agile way, but they do so. The problem is that they are disconnected from the user. So whatever they sent over to the team is not necessarily the right requirements and not necessarily is something reflective of the end user need. So they send it over to these guys, but remember these guys are disconnected too. So the implementation that they provide is not exactly the correct implementation of what they asked to build. Ultimately they send it, basically deliver it to the consumer, to the end user. But the end user looking at that says, oh my goodness, what is it? I don't like this at all. What is it? But then the customer representative says, hold on a second. Let me take a look. And she looks at it and realizes that it's not the right implementation. So she thinks that the problem is that the implementation is incorrect, not even suspecting that what's truly incorrect in this case is the requirements themselves. And the cycle just repeats itself where she asks to correct the problem and so on and so forth, creating a tremendous amount of waste in the system. Now, Connections matter tremendously, but there's one type of connections uh, that actually matters even more. Look, when we are building something, let's say we're building a new consumer portal, we build it for a purpose. In this case, to get improved self-service for appointment scheduling. Or when we go and, and go ahead and build a navigation system upgrade, that is to ensure improved navigation in limited visibility in this case. Or when we try to create a new neural network learning algorithm, that is to provide a better support for mission control decisions. Or if we go, for instance, with a new customer service repository, that's to uh, improve the customer service and so on. So you see the pattern here, right? We have something on the left, which is the asset or the output of our effort. And we have something on the right, which is the outcome. The asset or the output is a thing. And that thing in and of itself, it's hard to even say when it's valuable, when it's not valuable, unless the outcome is fulfilled. And the outcome is not a thing. It's usually some kind of human behavior that we're trying to enable. So this is really key because if we have a disconnect here, then none of it matters. All of our capacity is wasted because we built the wrong thing. We built something that doesn't even matter to the customer. And the reality is such that we, we don't necessarily 
are in that binary case where we have either everything great or everything uh, ditched by the customer, right? It's a spectrum. But oftentimes we don't pay enough attention to what is happening to those things, to those feature sets that we uh, uh, so hardly work to deliver. Are they meeting the need for the uh, customer? Are they helping the customer? That's what we're going to talk about today. And first, we start, we're going to start with an important construct that will help us to better orient ourselves towards, um, towards outcomes. So let's pick that last example, customer service uh, repository. If we're building it, the first question that we want to ask ourselves is, OK, we're building it. We're building it so as to what? Right. OK, so we do this so as to help the CSR, the customer service representative, be able to find answers faster. That's why that customer service repository um, is in the first place. But let's not stop here. We continue to ask the same question. So as to what? Well, this is so as to the customer would get their issues resolved faster. And even that is not it, but also like to have more customers served as a result and so on. Maybe this goes all the way to maybe to the financial indicators that matter to that organization. This is what we call outcome chain. It starts with the outputs, but then has outcomes of the immediate outcome first and then the high order outcomes that uh, provide the right context for our work. And this is important because we may have disconnects anywhere on the chain. For instance, here, it may be that we've enabled the CSRs to, be, to, to find answers faster, but those are wrong answers. So they are still not helping the customer here with wrong answers, but they are fast, right? So that's why the, the, the full outcome chain matters. So maybe the disconnect is here because yeah, they're helping the customer, but they're solving the symptoms of the problem that the customer has rather than the real problem. And it leads to a collateral outcome, which is negative in this case, uh, low customer satisfaction. And maybe what our learning from this is that our solution isn't complete. Maybe what we're missing truly is another component to our solution, which is the issue router and tracker system that would connect CSRs to other professionals within the organization, such as the shipping depart shipment department, where uh, they would be able to resolve issues in a much more uh, um, effective and expedited manner so that the customers wouldn't even have to come back and, and complain again. Right. So and maybe this would resolve that collateral outcome problem and uh, help the, the organization to build an effective solution. But there's more to this. We often ask the question of value. Right. And so let's ask that question, maybe in the context of uh, some work that has to be done on that uh, CSR repository. So let's assume we have two large chunks of work. One of them is the fuzzy search functionality in that repository, and the other one is content utility insights. And we would like to understand the value of those things to decide which one to work on first. Very simple and totally legitimate request. Well, let's also assume for the sake of simplicity that they are equally sized uh, chunks of work. And if they are not, we'll just divide whatever we think is the value by the overall size or amount of effort involved. And we're back to that case. Then. So um, as you notice, I also added the ultimate outcome here, which is some financial indicator. Maybe that's uh, revenue increase as a result of this uh, CSR repository. So ultimately, that's, that's what we're getting out of this. Uh, how do we approach the question of determining business value? One temptation, a natural temptation, is to just go ahead and try assigning a dollar sign to next to each of those items. But here's the problem. Look at where the dollar sign is on the outcome chain and how far it is from the actual output, output of work. And that's exactly where the features are implemented. There's so many levels of indirection to, uh, to the point where we can speak of financial indicators that trying to, uh, trying to speculate about financial value of those software features is roughly speaking, uh, an exercise in creative writing rather than anything else. 
So maybe what we should do is a slightly different thing. And let's, for now, limit our consideration to just the first link in this entire whole uh, outcome chain. So what we're going to do is just look at the output and the immediate outcome there. And we will try to unpack this connection Unpack in a sense that we're not going to look at it, at it as a as a as a wire, but rather as a cable that has multiple wires underneath, and that will allow us to uh, basically reveal that important structure on top of which we'll be able to um, determine business value. So, how this will be done? We'll try to define these little wires that we call value paths, or the path through which value is being implemented, uh, maybe the product team will get together and uh, they will start discussing these two features and they will figure out that the decision-making framework would contain a couple of key value paths by simply asking, so how does value manifest itself in this case? And one of the things they would come up with in their particular example is, uh, well, this functionality is supposed to improve the inclusion of search results that may otherwise not be included. Uh, also, so this is the first value path that they identify. The second one is better relevance of search results, and that's the second uh, value path. And the third one is better quality of the results returned to the customer, those articles from the CSR repository. Notice that uh, these value paths are highly contextual. These matter to this particular team, to this particular product, but another company, another product, maybe even in the same company, you would have a completely different uh, structure of value path. And this is the power of the method because uh, business value is always contextual. So now what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna uh, bring over each one of those features to the, to the left side of this equation and see how we can assess the relative value of these features um, against these value paths. So the first thing that we're gonna do is the identifying the importance scores. The importance scores are very simple con concept. We're asking ourselves basically of uh, how important is each value path to this outcome, okay? So in other words, how important is inclusion to, to help uh, CSRs to find answers faster, or how important is relevance of search results to, to help them find answers faster, and so on. You got the idea. And let's say after a little bit of discussion, they scored them, and this is the result, three, five, and two. And this only means that that one is this much more important than that one to this outcome, okay? So now we're gonna go back to our features, and we'll say that, okay, fuzzy search first, Capability scores this time. We're going to ask the, our, ourselves, uh, given that those are the important scores, how good is fuzzy search at, at, at supplying at those value paths? And maybe they will say it's five, one, and zero, which means that, for instance, um, fuzzy search has no influence at all over the quality of result, results returned. It may bring in some results that otherwise wouldn't be uh, uh, visible to the to, to to the CSR, but they're not going to change the quality of existing results, right? So, so you got the idea. We are reflecting on the capabilities of this specific feature in terms of satisfying uh, the the outcome in in question. And all we need to do now is just calculate the total value by multiplying the two scores down each path and adding up the results like so. And we got ourselves the number twenty. And we do exact same thing for the next thing for content utility insights. And here we have different capability scores, obviously. Uh, now, uh, content utility insights definitely changes the way we, we think about quality because this is a feedback mechanism back to the editors of the repository and they may improve the quality of the articles. And that's why it's two here. So this value path is now enacted and so on and we calculated the result and it's 25 okay now we can answer our question we can compare the two and we, we may decide now which one to start with um, and deliver to to the customer first so that's it guys this this was the short story i just wanted to to give you a sense of some tools that are available 
And there's certainly uh, more in the book. There's a deep, deep discussion about value and outcomes and emerging solutions as such. But hopefully this gave you at least the initial idea. Um, I would be glad to answer your questions if there are any. Great, perfect. We have about, I don't know, 18 minutes uh, to, to answer some questions. So we'll just open it up to the group. If you're, I'm sorry, I look like I'm looking like way up at my own halo, but I just, because I moved uh, the, the screen so that I could see everybody and, and also see um, Alex's presentation. That was amazing and awesome. I thought this was super cool. Um, it's, it's so refreshing to see um, basically an original idea in the world of agile right like so much of the stuff that we um we hear about and teach and learn and consult and coach on is so hackneyed right and this is i mean for me this was like super refreshing um so feel free to jump in just go off mute and ask a question um or put it in the chat if you're a little shyer um but yeah so we've got a few minutes to um to just uh, drill alex on these ideas if you'd like to oh, that didn't come out right but yeah all right So I know most of you have never seen this before. So you, you must have some questions about this. Alex, uh, this is Linda. I have a question. Yes, Linda. So in terms of, um, in, in your experience, what have you found or who within, the, let me try to figure the, um, who is good, what's a good makeup of individuals to really strategize and, and determine, you know, the value that you, you've basically like um, shown in terms of, is it the whole team? Is, is it the, the sponsor, the, the product owner? And do you believe even the development team, the DevOps team in, in, in determining the value in the strategy? Okay, good, great question. It, uh, great question because uh, in part, uh, I, I doubt that this question has a simple answer. It's rather a contextual answer. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason for that is um, dependent on factors like, for instance, how enabled is the product owner in that particular environment, right? As, as, as one potential examples. Um, it, as, we, as we well know, many uh, product owners are just profoundly underpowered in organizations. And that's the flaw sometimes of just the approach it's done or the mentality of that organization that persists and uses the product owner just as a as a, you know, a, a nice label on a completely different role. So as someone who is just a conveyor of requirements yeah. from, from some higher ups to, to the team. So it, it depends on things like that. But generally speaking, uh, it, it doesn't hurt to uh, start talking about the role of outcome ownership in general and uh, think about who could play the role of the outcome owner and it doesn't have to be one person right so i, I like that you mentioned um teams and uh, some stakeholders and the product owner because it can be a shared role usually i i, I like to have uh, some representatives 